So uh, we have just looked at the a little bit at the very first factor uh, of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, the content of right view. Uh, this is only a very short introduction to the idea of right view, which is very large, uh, and we should really have looked at the Four Noble Truths as well, but uh, uh, this uh, uh, retreat is only really a brief look at the Noble Eightfold Path, because uh, we are look we're kind of having a different kind of framework. Uh. But what I want to do now is I want to have a look at uh, a sutta which I mentioned before, this is Majjhima Nikaya 27, uh, the shorter discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprint, uh, the Chula Hatti Padopama Sutta. And uh, as I mentioned before, this is the sutta that was taken by Mahinda uh, to Sri Lanka uh, that he used and which converted the entire royal family of Sri Lanka at that time. Uh, and that is how Sri Lanka started out as a Buddhist uh, country. Uh, and so this is quite a well-known sutta for that reason, and it's also very inspiring in m many ways. It has this beautiful simile of the elephant's footprint uh, and how the footprint of the Tathagata, the footprint of the Buddha, is like similar to the elephant's footprint. Yeah, sometimes the Tathagata, the Buddha, is called a Naga in the suttas. Uh, and a Naga is like a great being. Sometimes a Naga refers to like the serpents or the dragons in the dragon realm, uh, but it also means any kind of great being. So elephants are Nagas, uh, Arahants are also Nagas. Uh, if you're an Arahant, you are uh, like an elephant, essentially. Uh. <laughs> and it's one of the kind of ways of looking at the Arahant. Uh. Uh, and elephant, arahants are always like, also like lions, they're all these animals that they are compared to in the suttas. Uh. So we have looked at right view, and now I'd like to just briefly have to look at how this actually works in practice. Yeah? This is how the Buddha lays out what is called, often called the gradual training. Uh, and the gradual training is uh, uh, the path of practice from the very beginning uh, to the very end, and it lays it out. So it's really the Eightfold Path put out into a path, showing how all the various details fit together. Uh, so this is what this is about. I'm going to just look at it very briefly, because there's a lot of content here, uh, but I think it's worthwhile anyway, so because it's, uh, it's, it's quite... Uh, uh, revealing on how this this is this actually works. Unfortunately, I realize I have made a slight mistake because I have used this is the um, translation by I. B. Horner. It's really an old translation, which is not all that all that great in my opinion. So I will instead I will read from Adan Sujato's translation, which is not really which is uh, different from the one in the book, but uh, uh, should be close enough for you to see the similarities. Uh. So. Uh, uh, it starts off by, in the same way, uh, Brahmin, uh, a Tathagata, or a realized one, arises in the world, uh, perfected, a fully awakened Buddha, accomplished in knowledge and conduct, holy, knower of the world, supreme guide for those who wish to train, teacher of gods and humans, uh, awakened and blessed. So again, it be so formula, yeah, the Buddha, a Buddha arises in the world, uh, I realize what, what it sounds like a very mystical thing, arises, what does that mean? Well, it just means that someone penetrates, someone is able to see things according to reality. And this is, uh, happens every now and again, every now and again you get someone becoming a Buddha, uh, yeah, and then when you have the Buddha, it is like right view, essentially, arising in the world. Right view becoming available in the world. Uh, uh, without the Buddha, there is just kind of a, a kind of darkness, nobody can really see. Uh, and then the eye of the world arises. Uh, uh, and uh, this is how, you, uh, how the beginning of the path becomes possible. Without that starting out with someone getting right, right view, nothing else can happen. Uh, uh, because it just isn't available to anyone. Uh, so that is the, the Buddha and, uh, uh, and how that happens. And then, of course, once that right view has arisen in the world, uh, uh, then he starts to teach this right view. And that's how the Dhamma comes into being. The Dhamma is the teaching. Uh, he realizes with his own insight, uh, this world with its gods, Maras, Brahmas, uh, this population with its ascetics and Brahmins, gods and humans, uh, and he makes it known to others. Uh. Yeah, so you realize the full scope of the world, this is really what this is about, the, the whole 
potential for rebirth and all of that. That's why he mentions all of these things. Uh, this population with its ascetic and Brahmins, uh, in other words, uh, also the existing religions and uh, sects that exist in India at the time, understanding how it all kind of fits into place. Uh, and he makes that known to others, the Dhamma arises in the world. Uh, he teaches that Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end, uh, meaningful and well phrased. Uh, and he reveals a spiritual practice that is entirely complete and pure. So uh, uh, this is the, uh, one of the descriptions of the Dhamma, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. Uh, there is good results all the way through. Uh, you don't uh, sort of regret it halfway and find out it was bad in the middle. It uh, doesn't work like that. It's <laughs> you, have <laughs> you have happy Happy results the entire way as you practice this. Yeah, you could ar argue that beginning, middle, and end here is a bit like maybe sila samadhi panya, perhaps. Uh, yeah, the virtue, the stillness, the meditation, and the finally the wisdom coming from the end. Uh, it is meaningful. Saatta. It has a, in other words, it has a proper meaning. It actually goes to a real goal. It has a real purpose. Of course, being Nibbana, it is not uh, uh, some kind of halfway house or empty of true meaning. It uh, is goes all the way, and it is well phrased. Uh, the way it is uh, uh, spoken by the Buddha uh, reflects that goal and the purpose and the path and all of that. Uh, it is carefully phrased. It's not some. It's not haphazard like uh, uh, like a lot of Dhamma can be. And this this is actually one of the interesting things about the Dhamma is that the Buddha lays it down with great care. Uh, precisely because he knows it's going to last for a long time to future generations and all of these kind of things. Uh, and that is one of the things that stand out about the suttas, how systematic they are, uh, how clear they are, how they are phrased according to clear categories, uh, fairly easy to remember. Uh, very systematic approach to how the gradual training unfolds. Uh, uh, the, uh, all the sets having a, a clear progression within them, yeah, like the Noble Eightfold Path and all of that. Uh, there's nothing superfluous uh, and there's nothing missing, as we heard before. Uh, and this is one of the things that makes the Buddhist teachings really stand out compared to almost all other contemporary teachings of Buddhism. Uh, you can hear people give a talk on Buddhism. It's a bit kind of sometimes it can be very inspiring. It can be great, but it is not doesn't have the same structure uh, and the same accessibility as a teaching of the Buddha. And this is one of the things that I have found so useful to remember because it's so easy to go and listen to various kind of teachers, and it may sound nice and may it may even be nice in in many ways. Uh, 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 but uh, sometimes I have found that even though the teachings may sound nice on the surface, if you listen to them very carefully, uh, you realize they are nowhere near as clear as, as, uh, as you know, you know actually what is meant by these teachings here. But sometimes you listen to others, you're not really sure what they meant. Uh, yeah, because they're not as precise as the Buddha. They don't actually give the teaching with such a carefully thought out structure. Uh, so they may say things and you don't really fully know what they mean, even though it may sound nice on the surface. Uh, so sometimes people say, oh, it's much easier to listen to kind of contemporary teach than to read uh, the word of the Buddha. But uh, if you, uh, to me, it's the other way around. Uh, it's easier to read the word of the Buddha. The word of the Buddha is more precise and meaningful than the word of almost any, uh, actually I would say, any contemporary teacher, regardless of who it is. Uh, and this, this is not to demean the contemporary teachers. There are lots of good teachers in the world. It's just that they are disciples. Uh, they don't have to do the hard work of laying down the teaching precisely. That was done by the Buddha. So modern teachers can, more, can be more relaxed about it. Yeah? They can teach in a more kind of less formal and less structured way. Yeah? But uh, keep that in mind because I think that this idea that modern teachers are easier to listen to than the Buddha, I think it is a it is, it, it is uh, if you look at it carefully, it's actually, I think it is the other way around. Uh. So, uh, the meaning and the uh, letter are important. Uh, well phrased, he reveals a spiritual practi practice that is entirely complete and pure. Yeah, it is complete. There's nothing missing. You've got everything in there. Uh, entirely complete. Ekanta, no, so, sorry, Kevala Padipunna which means uh, uh, entirely com complete. Uh, uh, parisuddha, entirely pure. Yeah? Again, there is nothing more that needs to be added. The full purity is found right there in the path. Uh. 
A householder hears that teaching, or a householder's child, a householder's child, okay, uh, or someone reborn in some good family. Uh, uh, basically, it just means anyone. That's really what it means. Uh, so anyone hears that teaching, uh, and when they, uh, when that happens, they gain faith in the realized one, and they reflect. Uh, this is when you start to think, yeah. When you gain faith in these teachings, you start thinking. Uh, and this is how faith arises. Faith arises from hearing the teachings, uh, seeing the Buddha, and that the two should often go together. It is often not enough just to hear the teaching. Uh, you should see that the teacher is kind of the way they act, fits with the way they teach. Yeah? It's not like you teach one way, you act another way. Uh, uh, and uh, the Buddha actually said specifically to be the way he teaches, the way he talks, is the way he acts. Uh, the way he acts uh, is the way he teaches. Uh, the two kind of go together, they, they match each other. Uh, and this is kind of obviously an important thing. So both uh, what you see uh, and what you hear, both should be right. Uh, and then uh, there is grounds for having faith. And the longer you observe and the longer you can see that the conduct and the speech are uh, they, they match each other, uh, the more time you kind of give that, uh, the more certain you can be of the conclusion that there is something real going on here. Uh, um, you, you, you know, you can only fake things for so long and then after a while you, you kind of... You, you <laughs> So th things don't work anymore. So anyway, so you gain faith in the Tathagata. And then you reflect. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what you think. Uh, or this, at least, at least some, what some people think. Uh, uh, living in a house is cramped and dirty. <laughs> uh, okay, But the life of one gone forth is wide open. Uh, it is not easy for someone living at home to lead the spiritual life utterly uh, full or utterly complete and pure like a polished Shell, why don't I shave off my hair and beard, dress in the ochre robes, and you go forth from the home life into homelessness? So, uh, uh, shaving off your hair and beard, if you are a, are a woman, it's only the hair, you don't have to worry about the beard. That's, that's the advantage of being a woman, you don't have any beard to shave off, it makes it easier. It's easy to become a monastic. <laughs> um, so, you uh, so what is happening here? Uh, you realize the limitations of living at home. Yeah, uh, sambado means crammed. It means like you are. You have many things happening around you. There are people around you all the time. Uh, it's a rajapato, a path of dust. Uh, that is the home life, according to this. Uh, he calls it dirty here, but of course the, it is a it is a metaphor for the defilements. Yeah? It is easy for the defilements to arise in the home life uh, compared to a monastic life. Why? Well, because you have people around you all the time, you have more attachments, you have more worldly things, uh, so it's more likely that defilements will arise in the mind when you live in the home life. So it is more dusty for that reason, uh, more dusty in terms of defilements. Whereas life gone forth is uh, wide open, as it says, abocaso, it is a uh, out, abukas also means like outdoors, it's an outdoor kind of life. Uh. So um, this is interesting and it just uh, reminds you that uh, the ideal, if you really want to make uh, a super duper practice uh, progress on the Buddhist path, the ideal way is living the monastic life well. Uh. Yeah, this is really what this shows you. Uh, this is kind of the idea behind this. It does, this doesn't mean that monastic life is always better than lay life. That's not what it means. Uh, sometimes lay life can be better. It depends on how you live either the monastic life or the lay life. Uh, sometimes you can live the monastic life badly uh, and you don't really follow the rules properly or you're not interested in meditation practice or, or all of these kind of things. Uh, and then, of course, it's pretty useless, it's pretty pointless to become a monastic. Uh, it really depends on the monastic life being lived well and then it becomes fruitful. Uh, and in the same with lay life, it depends on how you live lay life. Some, some lay people don't live the path of dust, you know. Some people, some lay people I know live very simply, they live by themselves and they have, they don't, don't have many things in their life uh, and they may not be become monastics for, you know, some reason that there's something they have to look after like parents or something like that or they have some obligations in the world they can't get rid of very easily. Uh. So sometimes lay life can be lived really well, but as a general principle, uh, the monastic life is the ideal place to pursue these teachings. Uh, and otherwise the Buddha wouldn't have laid it down, he wouldn't have bo bothered having monks and nuns uh, if it wasn't for, the fact of, uh, for, for that fact. So you 
Uh, it is not easy to live the spiritual life utterly full and pure, like a polished shell, if you live at home. And then you think, hmm, maybe, that sh maybe I should then become a monastic, yeah? Dress in the ochre robes, yeah? This kind of like this, ochre robes. Not yellow robes, as you sometimes see. What does, what does I.B. Horner have? Saffron robes, okay, saffron. Yeah, maybe not too bad, better than yellow at least, uh, probably. Saffron is a bit more orange. So, um, uh, and then you uh, and go forth uh, from the home life into homelessness. Uh, uh, someone pointed out that homelessness these days, it means like the beggars on the street in the city is living under a bridge, uh, so it doesn't sound so, sound so good anymore. <laughs> uh, but of course here it means simply that you, you, you houselessness perhaps is a better translation. Uh, and then uh, you, you think about that, and of course at this point uh, what is happening is that the right intention is arising. Yeah? This is kind of the right intention uh, to the highest degree, is when you decide to become a monastic. Uh, your purpose in life is changing, your aim in life, what you are aspiring for changes. Uh, your entire value system is being, re you are re-evaluating your value system. Uh, and uh, so this is why you then decide to go forth and you uh, leave things behind. R from right view, the Buddha gives you that right view. The Buddha is like right view coming into existence. Uh, and that right view gets passed on to others. That's the Dhamma getting into the world. Uh, and then when you hear that right view, suddenly your entire outlook, uh, how you lead your life, changes as a consequence of that. Yeah? Right aim arises. Samma Sankappa comes into existence. Uh, and then, when Samma Sankappa comes into existence, it affects your entire lifestyle. It affects how you think about the life. And this is why from Samma Sankappa then comes a morality. So, first of all, after some time, they give up a large or a small fortune uh, and a large or small family circle. They shave off the hair and beard, dress up in the ochre robes, and go forth from the lay life to homelessness. So you go forth, and once you have gone forth, then uh, you start to uh, live in a different way, and you start to live uh, with morality instead. So that is uh, how this uh, first bits and pieces of the path uh, kind of come together. And so now I want to have a little bit more look at the idea of morality in Buddhism. I'm not going to talk about this in great detail because uh, there just isn't time for that. Uh, but it's very nice just to kind of just to remind it of the Buddhist sense of morality because it is very it is inspiring when you understand what it really is about. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the next sutta. This is the Middle Length Sayings number 41. Uh, it's called The People of Sala, page 123 in your little booklet there. Huh? And um, uh, let's have a look. So forget that here as well. Okay, so this is how it reads in this Majima 41. Huh? Uh, now we are moving first of all on to uh, Samma Sankappa. You can see here the order is different. Here the order is Samma Sankappa first, Samma Vacha afterwards. In the Noble Eightfold Path, Samma Vacha first. So why is there a different sequence? And the answer is, I have no idea. But there is a, <laughs> there is a difference in sequence there. So let us have a look at Samma Sankappa right action. And you probably know what this is already, but it's nice to have a look at it in a little bit more detail perhaps. So, they give up killing living creatures. Uh, they renounce the rod and the sword. They are scrupulous and kind, living full of compassion for all living beings. Um, they renounce the rod and the sword. Have you all renounced the rod? <laughs> It's, it's, it's a little bit strange. I, I don't sure why he translates in this way. The Pali word is danda, and danda literally means like a stick or a rod, and it is used as punishment. Yeah? So if you want to punish people, you take out the stick and you kind of whack people on the backside. So, okay, behave properly. Yeah? <laughs> and this is kind of the, uh, the idea. All of these things are used as punishment. So you could say that the better translation might be to renounce punishment. Yeah? 
because these are pun uh, this is what this is about. So no physical punishment, in a sense, uh, is what you're kind of giving up here. Yeah. So you give up the physical punishment uh, of any kind, uh, and you are scrupulous and kind, uh, living full of compassion for all living beings. Uh, and this is the nice part about this, and uh, this is one of those things that is always worth pointing out, is that uh, morality in Buddhism always has these two sides to it. Uh, it is about not doing the bad, but also doing the good. You're supposed to be compassionate, you're supposed to be kind, you're supposed to help people, you're supposed to help them sustain life and live better. Uh, that is when you are practicing this uh, uh, first precept or, the or right action in the right way. Uh. So always, it's not, you know, sometimes we stop at actually even getting people to keep the five precepts is quite hard, but once they get there they think, okay, now I'm being a real Buddhist, but actually you should take it even further. If you want to be really serious about Buddhist practice, uh, this is what you should be doing here. Not just keep the five precepts, uh, that is kind of a, I'm not going to ask if there's anyone here who doesn't keep them, because that always becomes a bit awkward, so I'm not going <laughs> to say, ask that, but uh, uh, if you are doing that uh, already, wonderful, it is a great thing to do. But try, if you can, to take it even further. Uh. So being compassionate and kind yeah, is what it really is about. Uh. And uh, this is um, a very important principle, because as long as you are compassionate and kind, uh, you can't really do anything wrong. Yeah. You can't do any bad actions if you are compassionate and kind, because these are the roots of what is called the kusala kamma, wholesome actions. You find this in other suttas, like in the Anguttara Nikaya, it talks about the roots or the foundations uh, for kamma. And there are three wholesome roots uh, and three unwholesome roots. Uh. And as long as you are acting from the wholesome roots, you can't really go wrong. Uh. And we were talking about this yesterday, about suicide. Uh, yeah, uh, And uh, the question then is, is suicide bad or, or, or good? And the only way you can really decide one way or the other is to look at where you're coming from. What is the root? Why are you committing suicide? And if you are committing suicide for the wrong reasons, it is bad. If you're committing suicide because uh, um, out of compassion, is that possible? Uh, maybe it is possible. Yeah, you've just had enough. You don't want to live anymore. You have compassion for yourself. Okay. My life is coming to an end anyway, yeah, I'm having this really terrible sickness, uh, please turn off those stupid machines keeping me alive. Uh, yeah, and is that bad? Maybe not. Uh, yeah, maybe if you are coming from the right place. I, it's impossible to know for someone else whether you're coming from the right place or not, uh, but sometimes these things may, be, may not be bad. Uh, and there is so much stigma with these things already in the world uh, that uh, sometimes uh, we need to look at these things from a deeper angle. Uh, and the same thing, if, some, if someone commits suicide because they have a lot of suffering in life and lots of problems, uh, and they commit suicide for that reason, then uh, is it bad? Maybe, maybe not 100% ideal, there might be a little bit of delusion there, uh, but nothing too terrible that you have done. Uh, yeah? You're not hurting anyone else uh, on purpose or anything like that. Uh, you commit suicide because you feel a bit desperate, uh, and then uh, you get reborn again afterwards. And when you get reborn, it is all how you have lived your life overall that matters, uh, and that last act that you do actually is not necessarily going to have that much impact on what happens. Uh, <laughs> Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, uh, the idea here is that we have to look at these things more deeply to understand what is going on. And there's so much stigma with suicide, but actually we often misunderstand what is, what is happening here. And it may not be such a bad act if you look at a person's life overall. Uh, and uh, it changes the whole calculation and how we look at these things. Uh. And this is true with all of these precepts as we go through them now. Remember that whether something is good or bad, these are just a precept uh, that we keep, the five precepts, are just an approximation to what is moral. Uh. If you really want to understand what is moral or immoral, uh, you have to go back to the motivation and the intention of the person. Uh. If the motivation is pure, if the intention is pure, you can't really go wrong. Yeah. Uh, even in cases like lying, for example, uh, there are different ways of lying. You can lie with really bad intent because of greed, because of anger. Uh, but you can also, sometimes you can lie perhaps out of compassion in situations where it is very difficult to know what the right thing is to do. Uh, 
So you have to look at your intention, only then can you really know. Uh, so the reason why we have the five precepts is because sometimes uh, it is just so difficult to judge our intentions. Uh, sometimes we are deluded, sometimes we are a bit in the darkness, and then it's very useful to have some rough guidelines to guide us. Uh, but they are not the final analysis uh, as far as morality is concerned. Uh, so this does not mean that you can throw out the five precepts and just do whatever you think is feels right in the moment, because uh, as I said to you, sometimes we are just too confused to really be able to judge the situation properly. Uh, so uh, please uh, keep that in mind, but there may be occasions when uh, uh, they are not the right standard to use. Uh. So this is the idea of having compassion for living beings. Yeah, this is really the standard for what is right. And then, uh, again, you can't go too far wrong. Yeah. Uh, second one, second aspect of uh, uh, right action is to, they give up stealing. Yeah. They don't, with the intention to commit theft, take the wealth or belongings of others uh, from the village or the wilderness. Yeah. And then you have an alternative in, uh, description of stealing, which is also found elsewhere. They give up stealing, they take only what is given. Uh, they expect or desire only what is given. They keep themselves pure or clean by not stealing. So uh, again, the idea of stealing here uh, is uh, the idea that you, uh, again, it is in the end, it def depends on your intention. Yeah, the Intention is the final decision on whether something is bad or good karma. Uh, but generally speaking, you can, you can assume that stealing will be bad 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, but there may be the very, uh, you know, uh, exception sometimes uh, uh, because of exceptional circumstances where these things may not be problematic. Uh. And um, uh, the, uh, one of the little nice things that you see here in the second one, in the alternative description, they give up stealing, take only what is given. Uh, and then you have the desire only what is given. Uh, and uh, so if you want to take the idea of uh, not stealing uh, to the kind of to the highest uh, limit, if you like, then even just the desire of having what belongs to other people is bad, because that obviously is the start point of stealing. Uh. So if you don't have any desire to kind of have the belongings of others at all, uh, that is of course the ideal way of, uh, uh, of avoiding a stealing at all. It's a much more pure, pure way of living. Uh, and he, there you can see how the, uh, you know, the, how the um, physical act or the right action uh, actually moves uh, onto right thought as well, right way of thinking about things. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the deeper sense of morality is thinking in the right way. Uh, and here the two are kind of almost conjoined in this idea of not stealing. Uh. So you don't steal, uh, and uh, of course the opposite of not stealing, the good action here is generosity. Yeah, this is the alternative. Uh, it is not mentioned here because uh, generosity is a factor on the path in its own right, uh, and that's why it's not mentioned, but that is the opposite. Stealing is greed, it is taking things for yourself that is not yours. Uh, generosity is anti-greed, uh, it is the sharing and, uh, and caring for other people. Uh. Uh, then we have the uh, next one on uh, uh, sexual misconduct. So they give up sexual misconduct. Uh, they don't have sexual relations. And then uh, uh, this is kind of phrased in the kind of ancient Indian way. So uh, they don't have sexual relations with women who are uh, have their mothers and fathers, in other words, who are guarded by all of these kind of people. Uh, yeah, protected by law, protected by husband, by uh, being engaged, and all of these kind of things. Uh. He has the uh, idea here of uh, even one who is garlanded as a token of betrothal. That means that you are engaged to be married. That's what the purpose of that is. Uh. So, uh, but, uh, uh, so here, the, this is kind of the, uh, the way it is phrased in the ancient Indian context. But uh, of course, it goes both ways. Uh. So it is not just, uh, so it, it is from both sides, both genders. So if you are a woman, of course, it is exactly the same thing. Uh, yeah, it is, uh, but it, this is kind of spoken from a male perspective, but it goes both ways, obviously. Uh. So this is the idea of kame su michachara, or sexual misconduct. And in a modern context, uh, basically any kind of 
illegitimate sexual relation uh, would be kind of included under this particular rule. Uh, and uh, it would include such things as being unfaithful uh, to one's partner, of course, uh, uh, because unfaithful to a partner, the idea of getting married uh, is, of course, to have an exclusive relationship with someone else. That's kind of the purpose of that. Uh, so you are breaching your, um, uh, your trust uh, in the married relationship, or even just any relationship, uh, if you then have relationships outside of that. Uh, so that will be part of this. Uh, it is uh, defined according to the standards of the society that you live in, which is kind of interesting about uh, uh, this particular precept. Uh, Okay, so those are the three kinds of uh, uh, bodily misconduct. We could maybe say that, uh, I didn't say anything about the opposite of uh, sexual misconduct, but the opposite, of course, is the, is the kind of giving up of uh, uh, any, any kind of desires in the sensual realm. Uh, that is really the opposite, and then because that is what allows you to move towards meditation and all of those things. Uh. So that is the um, uh, bodily conduct in brief, uh, a lot more could be said about that, but uh, I think we will leave it at that because uh, this is not the time to go through these things in great detail. Uh, so let us have a look at the uh, speech. And uh, the first one is they give up lying. Uh, if they are summoned to a council, an assembly, a family meeting, or a guild, or to a court, and they are asked to, to be a witness, and please, mister, say what you know. Uh, not knowing, they say, I, I don't know. Knowing, they say, I know. Not seeing, they say, I don't see. And seeing, they say, say I see. Yeah, so you are give up lying. You don't, kind of, you, uh, you, you don't misrepresent the truth, really. Uh, so they don't deliberately lie for the sake of themselves or another or for some trivial worldly reason. Uh, so uh, this gives you the feeling that uh, when we talk about lying, it is, a, you know, in this case, it's quite a serious thing. Uh, yeah, you are go to court and then you kind of put your hand on the Dhammapada and you swear, I shall not lie, yeah? Is that what you do here in Malaysia? I don't know what, what you do in Malaysia. That's what you do in, uh, in Australia, yeah? You kind of, if you're Christian, you put your hand on the Bible and say, okay, I, shall, I promise to tell the whole truth, the full truth, and whatever else it is. Uh, and uh, now in Australia, it's like you can choose. If you're not a Christian, you don't have to put your hand on the Bible. You can choose some other book, yeah? So you choose the Dhammapada or whatever. Uh, and what do you choose if you're an atheist? What is the atheist kind of b version of the Bible? I wonder, what, what is the atheist? What is the a kind of atheist book? Maybe Richard Dawkins, you know, something like that. You put your hand on one of the Richard Dawkins books and you say, okay. <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, so it is quite a serious matter, and this is kind of when lying becomes very serious, because you really are, uh, you are um, uh, 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 deluding people into believing one thing that is very opposite of what, uh, what you think it is. Uh, so uh, this is how lying is defined. But of course lying, as with all of these precepts, uh, it comes in a large variety of degrees and, and, uh, and uh, uh, s severities, uh, and of course the purpose here is to try to approximate, to be as truthful as possible uh, at all times. Uh, the other definition of lying here is, uh, which I have added there just for completeness, uh, uh, they give up lying, they speak the truth, stick to the truth, uh, they're honest and trust trustworthy, they don't trick the world with their words, uh, they, don't or they don't deceive the world with their words. Uh, so this is like the kind of the, if you want to take not lying to the highest standard, uh, it is about being as straightforward and as honest as you possibly can. Uh, yeah? You say things exactly as they are. You don't kind of try to hide things uh, because you feel embarrassed or because you want to you know, protect someone. Or Actually, protecting someone is, a, is obviously good to do, at least under certain circumstances. Uh, but in some circumstances, it is not very useful. Uh. So you try to be as honest as you possibly can. This is really the holy grail of right speech, yeah, of not lying, is that you maximize the, uh, the um, reliability of how you speak. You are trustworthy. People know that when they listen to you, they will get exactly what you say. That is exactly what you mean, and that is the way it is. Uh. So sometimes, and this is one of those interesting things, you hear people, they become like lawyers of... Uh, of Dhamma lawyers, yeah, uh, and they know the exact limits of these precepts. And if you kind of, as long as you stay just outside those limits, uh, 
you are okay, you don't have not broken the precept. Uh, but actually that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Uh, because these limits are very artificial. It is not about staying within limits. Uh, because the precepts are like there's really bad and there's a little bit less bad and a little bit less bad. The idea is to make it as good as possible. The idea is not to kind of fall within exact boundaries that are artificially created. Uh, so you try to uh, be as good as you possibly can. That is really what this is about. So you try to be trustworthy and reliable and then you are maximizing uh, the good karma and the, uh, the benefit of this kind of precept and right speech. Uh, and this matters, uh, this matters because uh, um, the whole purpose of this is to purify yourself. Yeah? The whole purpose of this uh, is to maximize the speed on which you make progress on this path. Uh, and unless you take these uh, ideas to the kind of highest, to the ultimate limit, uh, you will not make progress as fast. Uh, so you try to approximate living this in the best possible way. And then you're also maximizing the progress on the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, this is how you kind of, how you, uh, you know, we always uh, talk, talk about uh, uh, sila being the foundation for meditation practice, uh, sila being the foundation for anapanasati and satipatthana, watching the breath, uh, mindfulness meditation, how it is the foundation for samadhi and a foundation for everything in Buddhism. Uh, so unless you take that sila to the highest possible level, uh, it is not going to be uh, the best possible foundation for your practice. Uh, and then when you sit down, you watch your breath, yeah, you only go so far, and then it kind of doesn't go any further. And you wonder, why doesn't it go any further? And then now you know the reason. This is the reason, because you don't practice these precepts to their full potential. Practicing these things to their full potential is actually quite difficult. Uh, yeah, you start to realize, actually it takes a lot. Uh, yeah, you want to be maximum truthful, but at the same time, you should not use truth as a kind of, uh, as a weapon. Yeah, yeah. You know, someone is really embarrassed about something. You think, yeah, now I can use, I can tell the truth. Yeah, nothing fault, and I can say about them exactly what I think. Yeah, <laughs> that is also the wrong way. Yeah, so it is. It is quite tricky. We have to know the right time to tell the truth, and and not to use it as a weapon. Again, it goes back to your intention. Why are you doing this? Uh, yeah, and so this is how you. Uh, this is how you need to think about these things. Uh, so it is. Um, so in the end, uh, it is the mental state that you come from that is the most important one. Are you greedy or is it ill will or whatever? Uh, and then you can kind of get close to the truth. So the idea here is to use speech as something that is beneficial in the world. Using speech as a gift to other people. Yeah, Think of it as a gift. It's a beautiful way of thinking about speaking. Every time we open our mouth, uh, we can give something nice to other people, uh, whereby they feel good, whereby they feel happy, whereby they feel that they have been treated well by you. Uh, or speech can just be at the rubbish, or it can be even negative. Yeah, It can have all of these varieties to it. Uh, but if you think of every time you open your mouth, uh, you have the chance to give someone a gift. Uh, it's a very beautiful way of thinking about speech. Uh, yeah, so how can I make my speech a gift to everyone around me? Yeah. Then it becomes very powerful and beautiful and you know it is coming from something good inside of you if you do that. Yeah. Okay, let's um, look at these last few factors of right speech. Uh, you give up divisive speech. Uh, they don't repeat in one place what they heard in another so as to divide people against each other. Instead, they reconcile those who are divided, uh, supporting unity, delighting in harmony, loving harmony, speaking words that promote harmony. Uh, so again, very beautiful the way that is phrased. Yeah, you're always de taking delight in harmony, loving harmony. You want to uh, bring people together rather than divide people uh, apart. Uh, and uh, uh, so again, uh, look at your intention when you speak. Sometimes you may say something bad about somebody. Uh, and uh, very often if we say something bad about somebody, we're creating disharmony straight away. Because we're kind of giving the other person uh, a feeling. Yeah, we, we always leave, leave an imprint on other people's minds when we say something bad about someone. Uh, so we're always creating some division when we do that. Uh. This doesn't mean again that it is always right to praise somebody. This doesn't mean that it is never right to say something negative. Sometimes we have to say negative things. Sometimes there is danger. Sometimes there is abuse going on. Sometimes there is problem. We have to warn people. 
But even then, when you do that, uh, you should come from the right intention. You should come from the compassion for the potential victims, uh, and not because you want to have a vengeance against the person who is doing bad things. Uh. So again, it's finding that balance. Yeah, it is all. It is kind. Of it's tricky with these things. Uh. So again, it is about where you're coming from, why you're doing things uh, that really matter in this uh, in uh, in the Buddhist morality of things. Uh. So divisive, uh, give up divisive speech, uh, uh, speech that creates harmony. Uh, it's kind of anyway, so uh, let's go on to the next one. The next one is the harsh speech. Uh, so you give up harsh speech, you speak, they speak in a way that, that's mellow, pleasing to the ear, lovely, going to the heart, polite likable and agreeable to uh, most people, to the many people here. So, uh, is that right speech, that beeping in the background? Uh, I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> it's not mellow, it, it's not pleasing to the ear, yeah? I think that <laughs> must be wrong, wrong speech, I think. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, and again, this beautiful way of speaking, the idea that when you hear someone who speaks in the right way, you feel good around them, people like to hear be being talked in this particular way, you are polite, you are likable, but you don't really do it so much because you want to be liked by people, because then you have an ulterior motive, you are greedy, I want to be liked by everyone, so I'm going to be kind for that reason, but it's more this idea of generosity again, you do it simply because you want to be kind, you want other people to feel good, you want them to be happy, uh, and all of these things, uh, and uh, when you do that, uh, coming from that motive, uh, it becomes very beautiful. Uh. Yeah, like it will, that goes to the heart. The, some of the words here are really nice. I, I like to point this out every time because uh, uh, one of the uh, words here, which is um, pleasing to the ear, kanna, kanna sukha, means uh, ear happiness. Uh. Yeah, so when you, 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 you promote ear happiness in other people, uh, yeah, so uh, and that is quite kind of nice. And you have hadaya hadaya gamma literally means goes to the heart. So this is a, a, a word that is in common in the Indian languages as in in English. Yeah, the kind of that idiom or that uh, uh, metaphor that you have going to the heart goes to, goes. You know, you feel good. You feel kind of uh, you feel better when you hear this kind of speech. Uh, and uh, so it's very nicely the way this is put by the Buddha in this particular case. So please keep these things in mind. Yeah, This is how you again take the morality to uh, the highest, its highest potential when you speak in this way. It's the exact opposite of harsh speech. It's the opposite of yelling at people and kind of swearing and kind of talking in a harsh way. Do this, do that, don't do it this way, do it this, do it that way. That way is wrong, this way is right, etc., etc. And then we have the last one, which is uh, often the uh, kind of perhaps the most difficult one. And uh, this is to give up talking nonsense. <laughs> the words are uh, timely, they are true, they are meaningful, they are in line with the Dhamma and the training, the teaching and the training. They say things at the right time that are valuable, reasonable, succinct, and beneficial. Uh, this is how, uh, the, yeah, so this is the principle of morality of speech. Uh, so uh, this is a very high standard, yeah, and, and uh, it's kind of difficult to sometimes live up to this, and uh, speaking always at the right time, always what is meaningful. Nidana uh, uh, what is his uh, translation of that? Valuable, yeah, valuable is nidana, means like treasure. So you have this kind of treasure that you are given by other people because it is uh, like the word of the Buddha is something worthwhile treasuring it. You lay it down for uh, bringing it out into the, into the future when you need these things to support you in your life or whatever it is. Uh. So uh, it is useful to know that uh, with everything on the Buddhist path, I mentioned this already, these things are hierarchical. Uh, and because they are hierarchical, uh, uh, the most important aspect of right speech is the first one, not to lie. Now this is number one, uh, and this is where you make the most bad karma, is if you, uh, if you lie. And you can make the most good karma if you are really trustworthy and, and uh, uh, reliable. Uh, 
And then comes divisive speech. Uh, divisive speech is uh, again very bad because you create so much disharmony and problems uh, and so much misery. We know how, how much misery can come when there is disharmony in the community, the Buddhist community, or maybe the BGF or the Buddhist Society, or WA, or whatever it is. As soon as there's disharmony, it creates so much misery for everyone. Uh, so this is probably why there is so much bad karma. And then you have harsh speech, which is the, the next one. And the least bad one is talking nonsense, yeah? <laughs> that's good, isn't it? That's, uh, that's useful to know. Uh, uh, <laughs> but still, it is still, it is nice to be one of those people whose word is treasured, yeah? So kind of people think, yeah, when you listen to them, you get kind of really good. You get, get to hear something really nice because they usually talk meaningfully, yeah? They are really worth listening to. It's nice to be that kind of person because uh, uh, you are actually supporting people with meaningful speech uh, instead of kind of filling up their minds with uh, all, kind of, all kind of stuff. Uh. Anyway, that is in brief what is uh, uh, pre right speech and right action is about. Uh, and uh, I will uh, leave it at that because this is only meant to be a fairly superficial going through of the Noble Eightfold Path, not in too much detail. So let's have another break. 20 minutes or so, and then we can do some meditation together uh, afterwards. Sir.